Hey everybody, Donnie Gardner here with the Boston Terrier Society. In today's episode, I get to sit down with Jamie Martin. She's the founder of ColoredBostonTerrierGroup.com, and she's going to be talking to us about, well, you guessed it, Colored Boston Terriers. But she's going to be taking it from the standpoint of what the Boston Terrier standard is as far as colors. She'll be describing those in detail, the history of the colors, and kind of the fads that are going on today. This is more in response to my last episode where I talked about blue Boston Terriers. So this is giving us pretty much a uh, a holistic view of Boston Terriers and their colors. So I hope you enjoy this episode, and let's get into it. Well, if you want to go ahead and just tell me a little bit about yourself, um, how long you've been, you know, dealing with Boston Terriers, and a little bit about your website. Uh, well, uh, I've been involved in Boston for about uh, 14 years with about, you know, probably 12 to 13 of those uh, breeding and showing. Uh, and my husband grew up with Boston, so when we moved into our new house and we, you know, had the opportunity to decide what breed we were going with, it was kind of a no-brainer because they're such a, you know, a fun dog. Uh, and uh, one that he was already familiar with and one that we were, you know, really liked. So that was kind of the start from there, and then I got more involved in showing and breeding, um, and uh, now, gosh, I, I helped run a Boston Terrier education page on Facebook where uh, it's a uh, so there's about 2,000 people, a lot of them uh, very experienced Boston Terrier breeders, uh, show breeders who know the breed inside and out. Uh, and that was, you know, an effort to bring people that, you know, maybe backyard breeders, maybe color breeders, um, maybe just beginning breeders or even just pet owners um, together with people that really know this breed with decades of experience Um to be able to get the correct information to them because there's, there's right. so much misinformation online. A lot of people go to Wikipedia and it's, some of that stuff is just a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, so were you breeding dogs before or was this just when you and, hus- you and your husband decided 14 years ago we're going to get a dog? <laughs> Actually, um, I used to show uh, horses. I showed Arabian horses. I showed miniature horses. So I raised them and showed them for years. And when and we had 25 acres and, and the barn and everything, and so when we kind of scaled down to a house and a yard, huh. I still wanted, you know, a, a hobby, I guess. And so when I started getting involved with the Boston, um, I just naturally gravitated towards wanting to show them, eventually wanting to breed them. Um, so it was it was just kind of a natural progression, I think, from what I used to do. Yeah. Um, as far as like, I guess whenever you're getting started, so how soon? before you started this Facebook page, because I, I've talked to a lot of different um, people and everybody in the kind of industry or niche, you know, the Boston Terrier show niche um, knows about your Facebook page. Was this oh, pretty cool. relatively new? Or is this, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, let's see, it's three years old this month. Uh, I actually, uh, and this is, I guess it's, it's a longer story that probably I need to go into, but um, I've, I've always, I've kind of followed the trend of the color Boston Terrier breeding. And, and um, you know, I, I really support breeding for the betterment of the breed, breeding for health. And so for many years, I kind of just fought against it. And in 2017, I thought, I, I need to understand both sides of the story and battling against something is not getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I think bringing people together to discuss the breed, um, and and before, when you would go into a show breeder forum, um, it was mainly show breeders. Someone tries to go in there that has colored costumes, they're not allowed in. Um, It's, you know, there was complete shunning, um, and and I was one of those, very much one of those. I I didn't want anything to do with it. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I tried to bring both sides together so that the education for color breeders or maybe breeders that, that just don't show was also available um, to them. The same bre- the same information is available to show breeders. So that the idea is that in wanting to breed a higher quality dog, um, 
they would be able to recognize um, faults in their own dogs, um, good qualities in other dogs, be able to move towards a, a better, healthier Boston overall, um, which was going to benefit the breed. Keeping people away from good information about breeding and health is not a way to improve the breed as much as show breeders are against breeding color. Um, okay. It's not beneficial to keep information away from them. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I totally agree with that as far as, you know, bringing people together, get all those, get everyone talking, and then you can yeah. come to a mutual understanding. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so as far as, you know, the Facebook page, because I actually found you on your website before I even knew about you. Um, can, you tell me, <laughs> yeah, can you tell me a little bit about your website? Uh, the website was put together in in, in a, an effort to educate people on, uh, on history of the breed, there, there were a lot of things kind of going around about how the colors came to be and and how, you know, they were not accepted by show breeders. And, and there was kind of a whole different storyline happening at the time. And so I wanted to put together a site um, that was that was pretty clear on why they were disqualified, um, uh, you know, just, just, um, just some basic facts about it that could give people a, an overall view of the difference between the color Boston and the standard Boston and why they're, mm-hmm. they're not accepted in the show ring or, or for breeding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, as far as like the Boston Terrier standard for colors, um, I mean, mm-hmm. I know your website goes deep into this, but can you just give us those, I don't know if you have those handy or um, memorized just like the standard colors for Boston Terriers? Oh, yeah. There's, there's three standard colors and there's a couple of variation of the colors. There's a brindle and white, mm-hmm. there's black and white, and there's seal and white. And a lot of times seal is, um, if someone has a red or a liver Boston, they'll register it as seal, and that's actually not correct. Seal appears to be black, but in the sun it has kind of a red cast. It's just a slightly different hue than a black and white. Um, and then you can also register your Boston either black with brindle or seal with brindle, which is it's a mostly black or seal dog, and then they just have a little bit of brindle through them. And technically, they're a brindle, but when you think about a brindle, it's it's the mixture of striping throughout the body. Okay. I see whenever I thought of brindle, I always thought it had to be like kind of a brown, like pattern sort of color. Yeah, or you, you think like of a, a brindle. And, brown. Yeah, you, you think of a brindle, and that's what you picture. It's it's anywhere mm-hmm. from a um, a gold background down to like, you know, deep reds or browns. Um, that's the background and then you have the stripes. So that's what was preferred in the very beginning was the was the real striking brindle mm-hmm. with the stripes evenly distributed throughout the body. Okay. And then so like I said before the podcast and everything, you know, I started this website. I'm not an expert in as far as Boston Terriers. Whenever I was first spring searching like the colors and the standard to mm-hmm. me, seal, I would almost think blue Boston Terrier, you know, just as far as you, when I think seal, I automatically think gray. Yeah, because you think of the color of a seal. Right. <laughs> exactly. And so, yeah, I mean, that is what you, what you think. Um, and quite honestly, we've had a couple of judges uh, mistake seal or, or blue brindle for a seal brindle. And they... In certain lighting, and when you're, you know, you're judging dogs all day, and you're not expecting a disqualified color to come through, and you see that come through, and you think, well, seal. It's just, you know, you know, there's something a little different about the color, but if it's dark enough, mm-hmm. you, you can pass that off sometimes to a judge as seal, but it, when actually it's a disqualified color. So, you know, even even the judges get it wrong. So it's it's very um, it's very easy to understand getting it getting a little confused in different breeds. Seal can mean a, a different shade as well. So, um, just in our breed, it is typically almost black um, mm-hmm. with just a little bit of a red cast. Yeah, I'm on your website now, and I yeah. So if anybody's interested, go into your website, and I'll leave this it in the show notes below. It gives very good illustrations. Um, awesome. So as as far as like the importance of promoting the breed standard, because if you could just give us a little bit of backstory, because it talks about disqualified colors were allowed in back in the early 1900s. Um, mm-hmm. I guess you just give us a little bit of information about that and then why it's important to promote the standard today. 
Well, the, the, at the very beginning, um, the standard stated any color, brindle evenly marked with white, strongly preferred. Um, and when you, you think about the beginning of the breed, um, they were they were just putting things together. They were working through the details. They had multiple breeds that they were working with that also came in different colors. So if you were to start out a breed and you were to, right from day one, immediately eliminate all the colors that you didn't want, there was already a very small gene pool. So that, to begin with, is not very smart. Um, they had an idea what they wanted. They liked the brindle. Um, that was preferred. But they didn't disqualify all the colors right at the start. Um, and that, I would say, for probably, it's under 20 years that any color was accepted. In fact, I believe the, the third registered Boston was a fawn. Um, and they, you know, they, so there is uh, proof of there being liver, there being um, blue, or what they called mouse back then, um, and of fawn. I don't know if I've ever seen pre-mentioned or any, you know, there's no other, like the lilac dilute that I didn't see anything about that. Um, but those other colors, they, there is definite mention. Um, however, there's, as they moved forward, within the first 20 years, they eliminated those. They went straight to straight brindle with white markings. Black wasn't even allowed at that time. It was brindle with white markings or, or nothing at all. Huh. Um, and I think part of the reasoning of eliminating those colors is the standard says, and it has always said, and has never changed from saying the nose is black. Um, it says it's black and wide, and that has never changed. So if you're looking at a blue Boston, a red Boston, um, those are self-colored noses. So you're going to blue Boston is going to have a blue nose, even though sometimes it's dark enough to appear black. It's not actually black, it's blue. So the pigment on a blue Boston is wrong from the very beginning, from the very first standard um, ever created. A blue nose is wrong. Also, a red nose is wrong. So um, one of the most important things about the Boston Terrier is the expression. And if you're looking at judging a Boston, over half of that is the face, the expression, the head, that overall look. And so if you, in, in the, the eyes are described as um, large, round, dark, and soft. So if you look at some of the colored Bostons, they have amber eyes, greenish eyes, um, golden eyes. So that, again, is veering away from one of the most, not probably the most important element of the Boston Terrier, which is the dark eyes, the dark nose, that overall soft, beautiful expression, mm -hmm. the colors detract from that. So, you know, there's no, it doesn't say in the old, you know, history books that that's exactly why they did it. But if you're looking at the standard and you're looking at the progression of it, you can see that when they got to the point where they were narrowing down what they wanted, um, expression being so important would obviously eliminate those colors. Um, it, it just never fit the standard from day one. Right. As far as like, because I know, well, all reputable breeders are going to do some type of health screening on their dog. I don't know right. if they do it on their puppies, but is there a way to, because, you know, the color is a, it's a recessor gene, correct? Uh, yes. Well, most, most of them are, are recessive. You'll, okay. Uh, uh, the Merle is kind of a different animal mm -hmm. altogether, but that's you know that's kind of outside of, of what we're discussing. But in, in general, okay. yes, there are but, um, um, I, I guess my that. yeah, I guess my question is: Is there a way to screen that type of stuff, or is it all visual? Um, absolutely, you can you can screen out carriers. Okay. Um, generally, it's it's visual. You know, when you have a dog that isn't you know a, a standard color. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can screen your breeding dogs and you can screen out carriers. What's pretty interesting is I, I have a friend that um, used to breed Bostons and she decided, or excuse me, used to breed colored Bostons. She decided that she wanted to um, change over and just breed standard. And she still had some lines that, you know, they're dogs that she really liked. They were, they were good looking dogs. And she wanted to kind of continue on with some of her old lines. But they were mm -hmm. colored dogs, so each generation she bred to um, standard color and tested the puppies. And she found very quickly, within the first couple of generations, the color carriers nearly disappeared. 
So it was very easy for them to be bred out. Interesting. Um, so you will find um, with color breeding, most of the time they're breeding color to color. They they will not go out and breed to standard because that starts to eliminate the color in the program. So it was pretty easy early on to eliminate most of the colors almost completely until they um, the fad kind of took off about the mid 2000s. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it, you know, it um, exploded at that time. But prior right. to that, it had been fairly easy to, to just about eliminate all of the, the colors that were not standard colors. Hmm. As far as, um, I guess, breeding for color, because I try to do research on this on my own and everything, but I didn't mm-hmm. know if you knew firsthand. Are there certain health issues related to that or what could come about um, as far as breeding only, for color? Okay, the only one, there's a couple of different... Um, issues there. The only one that's specifically related to color would be color dilution alopecia. And you'll have color breeders telling you, well, I've never had a problem with it. It's not a problem to breed. I have friends at rescue that say, oh my gosh, it's a huge problem. We see um, CDA a lot more often in these diluted uh, Boston's. Mm-hmm. And, but both of that, that's both is empirical evidence. So there's nothing really scientific that. Um, in, that and that's what I found too. Boston's. Yeah. yeah. Because so I've seen studies in, uh, oh, it was, uh, I think it was dash hounds mm-hmm. on, well, whenever you're breeding for blue, that alopecia right. will pop up at a higher rate. Yeah, and in some breeds, it, it comes up more often than others. Right. So yeah. um, it it is related to blue or dilute. You know, it can be related to, to the lilac colors where you're further, further diluting um, the color. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily happen all the time. So it, it's something that's kind of an iffy area. Mm-hmm. Um, the the only other reason that health can be affected by color breeding is if you look at the fact that show breeders who are breeding to standard, um, typically they've got health tested dogs for generations back. They've been breeding for health and for confirmation for decades. So you've got a more solid, healthy background in a dog that's been bred that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at most colored dogs, um, and, and you know, as a as a side note, when a show breeder would get a colored dog, which is very rare, but if they had a, a red or a blue pop up in a litter, they would uh, spay or neuter that dog and place it. In, mm-hmm. in the very very early days, there were much um, harsher methods of culling, um, but you know, we're much more civilized. Yeah. They can tell that that doesn't uh-huh. happen anymore. Uh, unless someone is crazy, <laughs> right. but yeah. uh, uh, but those are spayed and neutered and placed at home. So you're not going to find colored Bostons coming from show breeders. So what you have is you have colored Bostons coming from pedigrees that are mainly um, you know backyard bred Bostons, which maybe you know their goal may just be to breed pets. That they may have not even planned the breeding, or it's it's not something that's done for. Um, the future of the breed. It's just breeding to have puppies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when the fans started to take hold in the mid 2000s, um, and I was this is when I was getting involved in in Boston, and I was watching this. I was looking at all the ads because I knew I would be, you know, buying a puppy soon. And, and so yeah. it started around 2004. And um, I saw there were at the very beginning there was just a handful of reds. And then pretty soon, that became really popular. There were a ton of reds. And pretty soon, blue came up. That became really popular. There was a ton of blue. And it seemed like there was more and more and more. And these, a lot of them didn't look like as much like Boston's as they did look like mixes. And um, if you think about the fact that whenever there's a fad that pops up or something that's profitable, there's always unethical breeders with, you know, puppy mill type breeders that jump in too. Now, that's not to say... Um, all color breeders are, are like that. I know some very good ones who love to breed, who want to breed quality. Um, but you have to throw in the people that are also more interested in the money-making ability of producing a certain color. And right. when there's very few of them to begin with, um, there's the, and, and I've seen this unfortunately with genetic tests, with with um, just looking at a breed and you know that it's mixed, excuse me, that it's mixed, 
Um, how easy would it be to take, say, a red or a blue pit bull, cross it with Boston, you get Boston-looking puppies that you stop the tails on or whatever, um, and you put AKC papers on them. Um, there were people doing that. I mean, I'm not saying everybody was doing that, but um, when we look at the honesty of some breeders and what they will do for profit, we know that that happened. And so there's there are certain characteristics of certain breeds that tend to go along with the colors um, that these buttons are, are coming up in. And so what's what's difficult is to know where the color naturally happened and where, you know, some of these dishonest breeders weren't quite so honest and made the color happen through some not very ethical breeding. So um, what you're... What you're ending up with, and, and when people are focusing on color, a lot of times the next generation is chosen um, by color. Then at birth, it's like, okay, is that a litter of five? You've got one cream in there, you want a cream. That's the next generation, regardless mm-hmm. of type, confirmation, it's health. A lot of times it's chosen by color, and that's how they're bred is to, to move the, the color genetics forward rather than picking the healthiest, best representative of the breed. So you're increasing the chances of having a much unhealthier dog when you have people breeding specifically for color, when you have the possibility of other genetics from other breeds being thrown in, and you have many generations of dogs that have never been health tested. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's the practices. It's not necessarily the color that can cause one to be less healthy than the other. Okay. And I know that was a long-winded explanation. No, 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 that that was perfect. Um, Yeah, no, that's great. Because I have some follow-up questions to that. So as far as like, yeah, as far as like breeding practices and everything, um, what should be the proper way? Because I've seen Boston Terriers, well, since doing my website, Boston Terrier Society, whenever I talk Mm -hmm. about the temperament of Boston Terriers, some people are like, oh, mine's super wired or something. So with breeding to color or you know, not breeding to um, the look of a Boston Terrier and everything like that affect the temperament of the dog? Um, the look, or, I mean, just the look in general doesn't have much to do with the temperament, but if someone is infusing the genes of another breed, they're also infusing the disposition of other breeds as well, so that can mm-hmm. affect it. Um, breeding practices in general, if you're if you are choosing for color and you're not choosing maybe for the best dispositioned puppy to move mm-hmm. forward into a breeding program, that can, you know, that can affect it. Also, inbreeding can affect it. And, and unfortunately, I have seen a lot of breeders in the, the pursuit of color uh, ignoring health issues, uh, breeding mm-hmm. dogs with genetic health problems, um, and inbreeding. I have seen father-to-daughter breeding with no um, predictability behind Right. Yeah, what that, and that could have behind the breeding issues. itself. Right. Yeah, in, exactly. So whereas in breeding, I mean, very few very experienced breeders would attempt to do father, daughter, or brother, sister breeding. And that's when they know the health and the background of the dogs, you know, like the back of their hands already on both sides. But when you take color dogs with very, very um, unknown backgrounds and unknown health problems, and then you inbreed that. No one has any business doing that um, at all. I mean, that there's just mm-hmm. no good reason to do that, and especially when it comes for color, um, it's it's a very poor breeding practice um, because mm-hmm. you are setting the potential bad genetics and health issues. You are you're setting those traits in the next generation and then to move forward with with that cross and those potential very, you know, set traits, is, that's a dangerous game to play in the pursuit of color. Okay. And so as far as like, um, I guess just breeding practices that you could highlight, because on your webpage it talks about, um, you know, you it's better to breed the standard just because obviously mm-hmm. keeping the standard intact is... right. I mean, that's the whole reason, that's what makes a Boston Terrier a Boston Terrier. So what are some people that might be trying to chase, you know, these uh, rare type of Bostons? What would you say to them as far as looking at a breeder? I know you're not trying to promote it, but you do highlight things on your website. Well, if there was was someone that said, I absolutely want, you know, X 
colored Boston, and I'm not going to change my mind. Mm -hmm. And they are looking for a Boston that breeds color. They should look for one that fully health tests. Now, most color breeders will JHC test or JHC and VM, um, which is barely scratching the surface of what you should be testing for. There's some main issues in Boston, one of which um, being eye issues, and they should be tested annually for. So a lot of times people think that testing for juvenile hereditary cataracts covers the eyes of the dog. That's not the case. We're, we're seeing Bostons that go in to get their their care test for the year, and they may be JHC negative, but they've got cataracts coming up at two years old or three years old. Um, that's important information for a breeder to have. They need to check their dog every single year and see if they've got mm -hmm. these issues coming up. If you're just JHC testing, you don't know what you're bringing. You could be doubling up on horrendous problems that people aren't going to find out till later when they buy puppies from you um, and they start to develop these problems. So they should be, at minimum, they should be JHC testing, which is juvenile hereditary cataracts. That's mm -hmm. a one-time DNA test. Um, the second one would be their testing. We do have some issues with um, deafness in the Boston Terrier, thanks to the English White Terrier, um, <laughs> adding mm -hmm. that to our genetics. Um, so they should be testing for that. And when people go, oh, my dog can hear, I know he's fine. A lot of um, unilaterally deaf uh, dogs are not obvious. They seem to hear like any other dog. But if you're not testing that dog and then you're breeding them, you're possibly passing that on to the next generation. And maybe you're going to get a, a bilaterally deaf puppy down the line, um, which you shouldn't be passing on. Um, the next test would be that, that annual eye test, the care test. Um, and that can detect several different problems, not just cataracts, but there's there's a variety of problems that that can that can check. Um, and then also patellas should be checked. Um, that can be done after a year old. It should be done periodically because if patellas are you know a little bit weak, you may want to look at maybe um, strengthening that in your program or removing that dog altogether if, if the patellas tend to get weaker with age. Um, also, another good one that is not the top four, you know, recommended, but also something that a lot of the breeders do is a cardiac test, and that can be done after a year old, um, and it should be done periodically as well. Um, and then um, some breeders um, also will do spine and trachea. You can you can do hips, but those those first ones are are the minimum that should be done. Those first four. Mm -hmm. So in looking for a good breeder. One that fully health tests, including doing that annual test, um, that's important. And ask for proof that that's done. Ask for the care test from within the last year on a dog uh, because that's, that's what a responsible breeder is doing. Uh, they should also look for a breeder who is requiring spay and neuter, who isn't just selling anything to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, they should watch for, um, they should ask for a pedigree, an extended pedigree, and look for any inbreeding that's happening in pursuit of the yeah, other. There's nothing really mm -hmm. you can tell from the outside, mm -hmm. you know, unless they have a serious physical defect. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> right. I mean, you would just want to look at an extended pedigree and, and just see if um, there's been a lot of inbreeding going on, um, and, and especially for the sake of color, that doesn't indicate good breeding practices. Okay. And then, uh, also, this is just for me. As far as like neutering, why? Because um, so whenever me and Emily Bella got our Boston back in 2009, uh -huh. and you know we were just doing research online, and honestly, at that point in time, we both just graduated college, so we were trying to find a registered Boston that was cheap. So mm -hmm. we ended up going to a backyard breeder, uh, you know, okay. not knowing any different, and right. we uh, where was I going with my train of thought? Oh, as far as neutering. Like, they didn't require mm -hmm. us to neuter our dog. Obviously, they didn't do any health screening that they gave us or anything. My question is, why uh, have the dog neutered before being placed in a home? Um, I wouldn't do it before placing a dog in a home. I would require that they do it afterwards because more okay. current research is showing that they need that growth. They need those hormones for their development. And so they're, they're finding that dogs aren't developing the same and don't have um, as strong of an immune system um, as one that's neutered before they've been oh. able to go through doggy puberty or whatever oh, okay. you want to call it. 
Um, yeah. So, yeah, you, you want to require it. Um, I, I definitely don't believe in, in early neutering and spaying, but I, I do believe mm-hmm. that neutering and spaying is important um, just to keep accidental breedings from happening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Um, we ended up getting Bella neutered whenever she was two, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's actually recommended is if you can wait till two. But a lot of owners can't handle the the boys marking everything once they start to hit. You know, they get their hormones and they want to you know decorate yeah. everything in your house. Um, uh-huh. And then a lot of them don't want to go through um, the heat with the females just because it's it's not a pleasure. Um, oh yeah, we had to put little toddler candies on there, little toddler yeah, exactly. candies in there. <laughs> in the pad. Yeah, it's, it, most people just don't want to mess with it. And the vet is like, oh, just have them spayed. And it's a you know, great right. solution that's all over with. But it's for uh, longevity, they, they have found that waiting till at least one, preferably two, is better. Okay. The uh, And then, so I guess the, my kind of last question as far as, like, do the standards ever change? Or is there a push or anything that could actually make these standards change? I mean, are you seeing that from all these colors? you know, Boston Terriers pop up? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. And I, and I think, um, I think a lot of color breeders at the start, unfortunately, were kind of sold on this story that the standard was going to change. And they were kind of on the, um, at the forefront of this brand new thing in the breed. And it was all very exciting. And, and um, they, they were not aware, I think, of how the BTCA views the standard and, and treats the standard. I've found maybe about 10 changes since 1891 to the standard. Um, it's okay. not something that is done very often. It's not taken lightly. Um, and it's changed very, very little. And it's usually a tiny tweak to clarify something rather than actually make a change to the breed. So the standard has changed very, very little. Okay. Um, there was a push and kind of and it's interesting with, with as few times as it's been changed, it was, it's interesting to actually see a proposed change and see the process myself, um, because there was a push to change the standard to, um, the standard had changed, it, I believe, in 2011, and it used to disqualify um, blue and liver. And instead, in an effort to screen out all of the disqualified colors, they changed it to any color not described in the standard. So there was a, to some, a perceived loophole um, to those who, you know, just know what the standard is and what it means and what it's always supposed to be. Um, There was no loophole, but because they had taken out blue um, or red, it was said that you could take a blue or red brindle and take it into the ring because it fell under the category of brindle. Um, okay. Which actually, it's not the case because, the, again, the standard says the nose is black and white. It, a brindle that is red or blue could never qualify to be a standard color. So, But there was this, you know, kind of this funny little tweak um, in the standard that caused kind of an uproar. And, and at one point, the BTCA um, had considered uh, changing the standard to... Not fix that little that little wording. Um, there was already a committee in place, so the process is, is taken very seriously. There's a committee in place that discusses it. Um, they got feedback from um, the members, and there's you know several hundred uh, members of the BTCA. So mm-hmm. those who were willing to send in feedback and suggestions, they took that. You know, they met, they discussed. Um, it was discussed at the annual meeting, and, and kind of. They they came forward with a a proposed change to the standard and it it didn't quite it ended up being a bigger headache than it was worth and kind of after all the drama died down and everybody you know kind of got their brains back into <laughs> into uh, yeah. uh, working mode in thinking about this we realized that anybody who's not trying to tweak the standard for their benefit understands what a brindle is. Uh, the AKC mm-hmm. definition talks about how it's black striping on um, on a you know a tan or, or brown base. Um, we've always understood that. The judge has always understood that. So there's nobody really buying into the into the idea that there's this loophole. Um, it's it's actually 
you know, it's it's just kind of the the push of certain individuals to to try and and get some changes done, and it, it really wasn't necessary. So it was it was interesting to see how seriously the BTCA takes the standard, mm-hmm. how um, how much thought and effort and input is is put into it, and how no one jumps into changing it without a very very good reason, and it's not changed very much. Right. So it's there's always been a very uh, a very strong protection of maintaining the breed as it was meant to be, as the originators of the breed envisioned it, as far as you know overall expression and just having that little oh, that great little you know American gentleman look. There's there's right. a, a very strong support of keeping that intact. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, great. As, as far as, um, you know, people wanting to find out more information that you have on your site and everything, what would be a good place for them to reach out at? Um, you can, they can go to, uh, it's www.coloredbostonterriertruths.com. Uh, and that describes a lot about, uh, a lot of what we covered today. I'm also going to add pages regarding, um, other, I guess, misunderstanding, uh, misunderstandings about the breed. Um, you know, some some people think that an airway is automatically fixed if you have a long nose Boston. Well, that's not the case because there are several components to the airway that, that may or may not be um, affecting the breathing. So I, I'm going to be adding uh, a page about that, you know, a page about how Boston can still be athletic and still have um, the correct muzzle and maintain Boston type. Um, I'm going to address Merle Boston's long-haired Boston. So I will be adding to the to the website as I go, um, mm-hmm. but as it stands right now, it's mainly covering um, the disqualified colors. Yeah, no, but there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of good information on your website. Um, as far as anything else that you'd like to leave with listeners, um, I would I would like to encourage anybody wanting to learn more about the Boston from people who have decades of experience and and who basically make it their their life to study the the Boston Terrier breed and the correctness and, and the conformation and structure movement all of that um, to go to uh, the Facebook page and it's called Boston Terrier Breeders Education. Um, there's a couple of different ones, but it's the one that has over 2,000 people on it. It's it's, it's the big one. Um, but to yeah. join that uh, to join that page, um, there's three questions that they have to answer in order to be accepted in there, and it's it's just to get a you know general feel for what they're looking for. Um, but I definitely encourage people to join that if they want more information about the Boston Terrier, and they want to get that information from people with a lot of experience in the breed. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you very much, Jenny, for the interview. Oh, you bet, Donnie. I just want to say thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you want to contact Jenny Martin or visit her website, be sure to look in the show notes below. Uh, All of her contact information will be there. Also, if you enjoyed this episode or if you're listening to us on YouTube, be sure to click subscribe to get the latest Boston Terrier Society episodes. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks. Bye. Bye.